so 33 okay and uh, I guess uh, last week it's been quite a quite a long time now I think last Tuesday is when we met last so let me quickly remind you the kind of things we were looking at uh, last week okay so okay uh, so so we were looking basically at, at constraint complexity equalizers okay Okay, so if you remember, we initially started with the situation where there was no ISI and then we went to a situation where you expect ISI, then how do you cancel it if you have, uh, after you do a match filter, if you finally have a finite impulse response, then you can presumably do optimum detection, which is with the Witterby algorithm. Okay, so in cases when you don't have a FIR response, you can't really do Witterby. So it's out of the question. So the only thing you can do is something suboptimal. And that's where these linear equalizers and decision feedback equalizers come in. Okay, and they play an important role there. Okay, so your channel can have a pole, right? It may stable inside the unit circle, but still it might have a pole. So in situations like that, we were looking at what to do, and then we ended up with linear equalizers and DFE. Okay, so initially what we did was we did not put any constraints on the length or the order of the filters used in linear equalizer and DFE. Okay, and then we derived a whole bunch of filters for different with two different criteria the zero forcing criteria and the mean square error criteria but for both criteria we derived what the optimal filters are we found what the minimum mean square error is okay and then we found the dfe mmsc seemed like a pretty good choice in most cases okay but still there were problems as in some of the problems included what what was one of the few problems with the optimal linear equalizers and dfe yeah so several times the match filter part of it Right, the, the precursor equalizer, so to speak, ended up having the match filter, and a match filter in some cases can end up being IAR anti -causal. Okay, particularly if you have a pole inside the unit circle in your channel response, which can happen, then your filter becomes IAR anti -causal, which can only be approximated. So, in several cases, the optimal things may not be implementable. That's one problem. And a couple of other problems. Another problem is that the order is really, really large. Okay, it can become very large. If the order is very large, then you can't possibly implement it accurately okay so you don't know how to approximate that for a finite number of taps that's the other problem the third and more significant problem is what if you don't know the channel okay so all these the optimal filters involve the channel response i mean they're, they're in terms of the channel response and if you don't know the channel response what do you do is a question okay so all these things are questions and uh, once again let me remind you the overall system okay so we took a general system model where this h of z is not necessarily minimum phase okay and then we had noise and then we have zk okay and then in constraint complexity equalizers we said we will put okay first we looked at linear equalizers i'll come to dfe also as we go along okay so we'll have a filter here with what n equals 2l plus 1 taps Okay, as in it's a 2L plus 1 order filter. Okay, C minus L to C plus L. Okay, so you have just 2L plus 1 coefficients in your filter. Okay, and whatever you get out, you're going to slice. Okay, under this constraint, what is the best possible C of Z I can pick? Okay, so that was the next question to ask. Okay, so now best possible I have to define using different terms. One could use zero forcing, but we didn't see that. We saw the MSC constraint complexity linear equalizer. Okay, so the mean square error filters what we saw, and we, when we saw it becomes it becomes like a linear algebra problem. Okay, just vectors and matrices, nothing more in it. Okay, so to be very specific, you form these vectors C, which is what, which is the actual filter. Okay, so this is the filter. It had coefficients from C plus L to C, I think C minus L to C L. Okay, so 2L plus 1 coefficients. And then I formed the other vector which is, which I call ZK. Okay, so what is this? This is a kind of a shift register which holds the ZKs. It goes from ZK plus L to ZK minus L. Once again, a 2L plus 1 length filter. So if you do this, you can write this output. I don't know what I call this output. What did I call it? XK or 
Would you call it XK? You must have called it XK. Okay. So we do this. You see, XK becomes simply C transpose times ZK, and then assuming, well, not assuming anything, the error then becomes SK minus C transpose ZK, and then you write a simple expression for the expected value of mod EK squared. Okay, remember all these things are complex and all these things are also random variables. So then you assume, assume a certain distribution for it and then you compute expectation over that. This is the definition for mean square error. Okay. Clearly, if you know the statistics for SK and ZK, okay, how do you know the statistics for ZK? ZK is nothing but SK convolved with HK plus NK. So it means you should know HK exactly and you should also know the statistics for SK and NK. Once you know all these statistics, statistics in the sense that it's enough if you know the mean and autocorrelation. Right? So this is all linear filters, just additions, just mean and autocorrelation will give you everything you want. Okay. So once you know those statistics, but HK you need to know exactly, it's not random. So you need to know that. Once you know that, the statistics for ZK can be computed. Statistics in the sense what? Maybe possible cross correlations with ZK and SK and autocorrelation of ZK itself. So once you compute those things, you see that the mean square error is nicely expressed as expected value of mod SK squared minus 2 times real part of C conjugate transpose a vector which I called alpha plus C conjugate transpose phi C. Okay? And uh, this alpha ended up being cross correlation between SK and ZK, ZK star is an expected value of SK times ZK star. Okay, and then phi ended up being expected value of what? Z conjugate times Z transpose. Okay, so it's basically the autocorrelation function. Okay, so once you know alpha and phi, the mean square error is completely expressed as a quadratic form in terms of what? Quadratic form in what variable? In C, which is what you want. So it's just like mad, it's, it becomes a simple problem of maximizing a quadratic equation. Okay, and that's a very trivial problem. You just one straightforward way of doing it is differentiate with respect to the variables. Z equal to zero, you'll only get linear equations. Okay, and we saw that that linear equation ended up being what? Phi times C opt equals alpha. Okay, so if you solve this linear equation, you get the best possible filter which minimizes the mean square error at the input of the slice. Okay, so it's really simple. Even the constraint complexity equalizer is a very simple, straightforward situation. There's no real complication. Just do it, you get the answer. Okay, and then okay, so this this has solved a, quite a few of the problems that we had so far, except for the problem that you need to know phi and alpha which in turn requires you to know the channel h of z. So what if you don't know the channel is the next question. Okay, so for that, we have to build what's called an adaptive equalizer, one that will adapt according to what the mean square error is calculated at the receiver. Okay, so it's, a, it's an adaptive filter. So basically the c will not be a constant filter over time. Okay, if you know all the statistics, you compute it and keep it constant. Okay, but if in an adaptive case, c will keep changing with time. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Okay, so you can see why an adaptive filter is useful for several scenarios. Okay, so you might know the channel at some time and the channel might change on you. Okay, it might change. Then at that point, it's good to have an adaptive filter anyway. Okay, so, so that you keep changing as according to the mean square error. And the other thing is, this mean square error can also be computed at the receiver. That's the very nice thing about the mean square error. How do you compute mean square error at the receiver? Instead of SK, you put s hat of k. So basically you subtract the input and output of the slicer and square it. And you hope that s hat of k is roughly s of k. So you get the mean square error. Okay, so that's how you adapt. You adapt according to the error of the slicer and you use mean square error. Okay, so to come up with an adaptive filter, first we saw an, an iterative algorithm for doing what? The last was for solving finding the solution for this linear equation. Okay, so a linear equation can be solved using several methods. One of those methods that I talked about was this iterative algorithm. So we're going to start with the iterative algorithm for kind solving the linear equation and that will nicely suggest an adaptive algorithm. Okay, so which will adapt C from time to time. Okay, so that's what we see. 
okay so to in last class once again we saw an adapt uh, an iterative algorithm so basically the upshot of the iterative algorithm was this following update okay so here's an update at the jth iteration or jth or j plus 1th iteration okay cj plus 1 is cj minus beta by 2 the gradient with respect to zj expected value of mod ek squared okay so you know this msc is a quadratic form in cj okay so the msc at j uh, after the jth iteration the mean square error will be in terms of cj okay and then i find its gradient and then how do i adjust cj i move in the opposite direction to the gradient okay so gradient is going to take me towards the maximum so the opposite direction of the gradient will take me towards the minimum remember all these things are quadratic functions so they're all well behaved you don't have to worry about all kinds of maxima minima here and there okay it'll have only one max minimum and you can get there okay the well behaved quadratics there's no problem there okay so you write this you get a very simple update equation okay so remember this is this is kind of like after the jth iteration so this is like mscj okay so you do the gradient okay so the gradient also we saw had a very very simple formula right so what was the very simple formula for the gradient okay you put that in it becomes beta alpha minus uh did i get this right phi times cj is that right okay so the gradient had a very simple form so you see cj plus one gets updated in a very simple way based on cj okay and then we analyzed how this algorithm converges okay as, as a function of j we were able to write very easily that cj could be written easily in terms of c0 itself like the error function the, error, the difference between the c optimum and cj could be written very easily as the initial error times some function of the eigenvalues of phi and phi is a hermitian symmetric matrix so the eigenvalues are going to be real we also assumed it's positive definite so eigenvalues are going to be positive okay so you know a lot of things about phi using all those properties you could write very easily what the error is going to be okay so the error well if you define qj as cj minus c opt okay we showed qj plus 1 is going to be summation i equals 1 to n 1 minus beta lambda i power j okay so this vi is and vi conjugate transpose this v j vi's are the orthonormal eigen vectors of of phi okay so it's hermitian symmetric so you know it's got a complete set of orthonormal eigen vectors so you take all that and expand you can, you can very easily show that this formula will work okay 1 minus beta lambda i part j okay so you notice so this this error term after the j plus 1 iteration is a sum of n quantities and each of those quantities decays differently as a function of j all of them decay exponentially but you can choose only one beta you can't make beta a function of i right so you can choose only one beta and depending on your one choice of beta each of these terms will have a different magnitude okay and you can make make sure that all of them are less than one by choosing beta to be what okay if you choose beta between 0 and 2 by lambda max okay where did i get lambda max so you know phi is a positive definite hermitian symmetric matrix so its eigenvalues are real and positive so you can organize uh, arrange them in increasing order okay so i might be able to arrange the eigenvalues eigenvalues of uh, okay from lambda min to lambda max okay so these are the eigenvalues of phi okay and if you choose beta between 0 and 2 by lambda max you know for sure that each of these terms will be less than 1 in magnitude okay so all of them will decay okay but still even if you choose it like this each of the terms will decay at a differing rate okay so if you want to maximize the rate at which it converges you have to make some careful choices all these things can be made okay but i'm not going to go into it but the only thing i'll talk about is when will the convergence be fastest okay okay so if all the terms decay at the same rate then you can pick a beta so that the convergence is fastest okay so if the eigenvalues are all equal Okay, if you have repeated eigenvalues say at 1 or 2 or some such thing, then you can pick 1 beta and expect that same convergence rate for all your terms. 
But on the other hand, if your eigenvalues are well spread out from 1 to 100, for instance, okay, then wherever you put your beta, there will be one term which is which is going to go much slower than the other terms, okay, and that will determine how fast your convergence is, okay. So in general, the statement you can make is speed of convergence depends on the spread of eigenvalues, okay. Speed of convergence depends on spread of eigenvalues. Okay, so directly related to spread of eigenvalues. Okay, so that's the first result that we see. Okay, so the next thing is how do you quickly relate the spread of eigenvalues to some actual channel physical entity as opposed to just looking at it as a matrix? Okay, phi after all is the autocorrelation function of Z. Okay. And then Z can be definitely, the power spectral density of Z can be definitely related to the channel. Okay, So I want to be able to look at the channel response and decide how the spread of my eigenvalues is going to be. Okay, So for this, we will use some results which, we, which, we, which I won't prove. Okay, The results I am going to use are the following. One can show that the eigenvalues of this phi will be limited by, will be bounded by the maximum over theta of Sz of e power j theta. Okay, this is my power spectral density and then the minimum over theta as z of e power j theta. Okay, this will always be true and you can show this very easily. This is not a very difficult result to show. Okay, so after all, the autocorrelation matrix comes from the autocorrelation function and the PSD of the autocorrelation function is the power spectral density. So this is, this is not a very difficult result to show. Okay, it looks difficult but it is actually very easy to show. Okay, you can use some DFT type arguments and very easily show, show that this, this result will be true. Okay, another thing which is uh, so so okay so this is this is the first thing so when will the spread of eigenvalues be less exactly when the channel is flat if the channel responds well this sz actually is related to two things what are the two things that sz is related to mod square plus the noise power spectral density let's assume the noise power spectral density is flat okay it's not changing with frequency then the, the variation of sz is completely controlled by the variation in your mod h square Okay, the channel square, channel response. If the channel varies a lot, then your eigenvalues are also likely to vary a lot. Okay, and if the channel is flat, then your eigenvalues will also be flat. Okay, that makes total sense, right? So if the channel is varying a lot, your equalizer is going to take a long time to converge. If the channel is flat, your equalizer is going to converge first. Okay, so that's a nice way of relating everything together and bringing everything together at the end. Okay, so looking at the channel, if it's varying a lot, if its minimum and maximum are well separated, then you can expect the convergence to be slow otherwise the convergence will be fast. The reason why convergence is important is that shows how quickly your filter will respond to a changing channel situation. Okay, In today's wireless communications people are moving about a lot and channel changes very rapidly and you want to build an equalizer which will adapt very quickly to changing channel conditions. Okay, So that's why these kind of things are very important. How, how quickly my convergence happens is very very important for that. Okay. That's the that's the one point. There's several other points you can make about how. Uh, so, for instance, lambda I, more, more things are known as n tends to infinity. Remember, n is your uh, n is the what is n? n is your iterations, okay? And uh, where am I? N is what? I'm totally confused now. N is not your iterations, right? N is your n has to be the, the dimension of phi, okay, so n by n. As n becomes really, really large, one can show that lambda min will tend to minimum over theta as z of e power j theta, okay, so this is important and one can make this assumption reasonably that n is becoming very large if you want, if you are using a, and lambda max will tend to max over theta as z of e power j theta, okay. So the reason why this is important is, if you expect a channel null, as in a zero in your frequency response, okay, what happens when your filter order becomes really, really large is your minimum eigenvalue is going to go to zero, which means your fee is not invertible anymore. So your optimal MSC cannot be guaranteed. Okay, so that's those are problems with the way this thing adapts. Okay, so once your fee is not invertible, lambda minus zero, your MSC can blow up. A lot of bad things can happen. Okay, so the way it works. Okay, so. So these are some uh, intuitive feeling for how the eigenvalues work and how, how fast you can expect the algorithm to converge. Okay. So any questions on any of this? What we've been doing? 
okay people are fairly okay with this so far okay so it seems simple all right so the next thing we're going to do is to consider a situation where you don't know phi and alpha okay you don't know h and you can't compute phi and alpha so how do you start off your equalizer how do you adapt is the question okay so so this algorithm is going to be called stochastic gradient algorithm one can also call it uh, lms okay least mean square algorithm if you want okay okay so the motivation is going to be very clearly from from the come from the the gradient descent okay so what did we have so far we had cj plus 1 being cj minus beta by 2 gradient with respect to cj expected value of mod ek square okay so if you look at a situation where you don't know h okay what are the things that are computable in this expression if you look at the gradient expression mod ek square one can compute you don't really need to know h okay you know z you put in through your filter you look at the slicer slicer input and slicer output you can subtract for each k you can easily compute mod ek square what is it that you cannot do you can't take expectation okay so you can only do time averaging if you want you can't take ensemble average expectation because you don't know the distribution you don't know h you can't do it so what do we do when you don't know something in an expression okay one convenient thing to do is simply erase it okay what will happen if i erase that e expectation nothing really goes bad right you can still take gradient with respect to c for mod ek square you know how to compute mod ek square you can take gradient with respect to c okay right so so that's the thing that is done in least mean square algorithm or stochastic gradient algorithm since you cannot compute expectation you simply remove it the reason another reason why this re removing it makes sense is suppose somebody gives you observations of a random variable okay some x x is some random variable it has a certain pdf and you don't know the pdf somebody tells you x took a value small x okay and if you were to ask if you were to be asked what's the best estimate for the mean of x what do you say the mean is x itself right so that will be the best estimate for the mean you can show it's the least mean square estimate for the mean okay if you are given only one observation of a random variable and you have to find its mean your best guess is be, your best guess is that that is the mean itself okay so that's what you are doing here you are given only 1k and you have to compute mod ek square and you, but you have to find its mean so instead of finding the mean you are going to say my best estimate is that what i computed itself and simply erase the expected value okay so that's what we'll do we also do we'll also do a small subtle change okay so here j see right, right now uh, we were looking at just solving an equation and j was a iteration number okay so in practice you are trying to adapt your equalizer to symbols that are coming in okay and for every symbol that comes in you want to adapt your equalizer once okay so that makes sense so every time you get in a symbol maybe you are able to compute a new e of k and for that new e of k you want to use that and adapt your filter okay so this j i will replace by k again so for every symbol arrival i have a filter update okay so i'm going to say ck minus beta by 2 gradient with respect to ck right modulus ek square okay so my k became a little bit corrupted okay so this is going to be my stochastic gradient algorithm okay so i take what i can compute as the best estimate of the mean and simply do replace that with the mean okay instead of the mean i use its estimate in the thing okay and also another thing i do is for every time i compute a new e of k i want to be able to update my filter coefficient so i think of my iteration number as the symbol arrivals itself so every time a new symbol comes i update my filter okay so my iterations are controlled by symbols okay so that's how the whole thing works okay so now this quantity is easy to compute just look at ek you know what ek is okay ek can be written as mod ek squared can be written as mod sk minus c transpose zk squared okay so you go through the same uh, quantity times this quantity times its conjugate and do the simplification you will get mod sk squared minus 2 real part of okay so 
thought I had it very clearly here. Okay, so minus 2 real part of what? C conjugate transpose ZK conjugate SK plus C conjugate transpose ZK conjugate ZK transpose C. Okay, this is just a simple uh, SK minus C, C, C transpose ZK times its conjugate. You do the exp expansion, identify the uh, parts carefully. Right. Ultimately, everything has to be real here, right? Real and positive. The left hand side is real and positive. So you do that, you get that. So now we take gradient with respect to C. Okay. Okay. So what you end up getting is the following. You can show this. I did, I did that once again before. Minus two e k z k star. Okay. So, it is instructive to do this carefully, you can do it in several ways, but the best way is to simply write the thing in terms of all the coefficients and then differentiate. Okay, But remember this is complex, C, C is complex, you will have to write it as real and imaginary part. So, you will have a lot of variables and then you will have to put them together carefully. Okay, So, you do all that, you will get the gradient to be minus 2 E k Z k star. Okay, So, this makes a lot of sense, the gradient is error multiplied by some other thing. right? So, you have, so you see why if you have, if you differentiate x square, you get x in it okay so it's good that ek is showing up here so that's, uh, that's the only point i want to make okay so you go back and substitute it back there you get a final update as ck plus 1 equals ck plus beta times ek zk star okay so this is my ultimate update for each k So, the whole thing works out quite easily. So, even if you do not know H, okay, you can start off with a C0 as your initial filter response arbitrarily somewhere, okay, something that makes sense to you. You pick some, some point, start off and then ZK is coming in. You let it through your filter, slice it, look at the output, subtract the output and input. That is your error. Compute beta times EK times ZK star, then add it to your filter, previous filter you had, you have a new filter. So, how do you choose beta? You have to choose it blindly, okay? Choose it based on some experience, okay? Try a few channels by, if you do, a, do some simulations with some channels, you will know what how to choose beta, okay? Pick it small enough, do not pick it very large. Okay? If you, going small is not a serious problem, okay? Eventually, you will converge. But if you pick it very large, you can end up in some kind of complicated situation, unstable, instability can result, okay? So, you pick it small enough, you will get to converge, okay? So remember all these things are vectors, okay? So this is, this is one update equation, but this is all vectors. So let me write it down carefully for you. Okay, so C k plus 1 minus L, C k plus 1, 0, C k plus 1, L, right? This is actually the vector C k plus 1, the minus L2 plus L uh, coefficient. And then for C k also, you have minus L2 plus L, okay, plus beta times, remember Ek is simply a scalar, the error that you got after the kth symbol arrived, okay, but Zk star is what? It is actually a shift register type, Z star K plus L down to Z star K down to z star k minus l. So, this is the actual update uh, equation. Okay. So, if you want to look at, if you number the rows from 0 to uh, 2L, okay, the last row is 2L, first row is 0. Okay. Suppose you take some jth row. Okay, in the jth row, jth element of ck plus 1 will be updated as ck plus 1 j, ck j plus beta e k. If you do the computation, I believe it will work out to k plus l minus j. Okay, so this is how you compute it. Okay. 
so one can draw a picture okay so i'm going to carefully draw a picture and then show you how this update is going to work okay so let's draw a picture here so you have s cake going through a channel which you don't know then noise gets added to it okay so now you have to have a shift register right the z case should populate a shift register of length 2l plus 1 okay so how do you make a shift register you just put a series of d flip flops if you want or in dsp they are denoted as z inverse basically delay elements okay so you put a one sample uh, delay element okay okay so 2l plus 1 Uh, well, you might have to put 2l elements if you want to use the present input and the 2l uh, minus one delay version of it. Each of these guys will get multiplied by what? They'll get multiplied by the by what? This one is this one will get multiplied by c k. Minus L. Okay, so this will be C K minus L plus one. Okay, so on. Okay, this last one will be C K plus L. Right? This will be C K L minus one. Okay, those are the multiplications. And then what do you do? You add up all these things. Okay, so I'll put a big circle here and write summation. Okay, and then you get what? Here okay, you get C K transpose Z K. Okay, which is the filtered version of Z K, right? The filtering I'm doing like this is the best way of doing it. And then what do you do here? What's the next block? Slice it. That's all. You just slice it to get the decision. You get your S hat of K. Okay. Is it okay? So now, how do you adapt it? You compute the error term. How do you compute the error term? This gives you e k, and this can be used in the adaptation. Okay, so this is used in adapting using those equations. Okay, so I'll draw another picture to show you how the adapting works. You see, see that more clearly. So, okay, so this is how your equalizer structure will look. Okay, you'll have a shift register for it coming in. Then you multiply all the Uh, values in the shift register and add them up. You get the filtered version. You slice it. You get the estimate of the transmitted symbol. And then you compute the error and use the error to adapt your coefficients. Okay, so you can use this, do this very in a very very easy way. Okay, but I want you to. Okay, so next thing I'm going to do is show you draw a picture for the adapting. But before that, I want you to look at this this very closely. Okay. Okay. So when I drop the expected op expectation operator in the gradient, I said if I if I'm given only, if I'm given only one e k, the best estimate for the expectation is e k itself. But actually, as k goes along, I'm getting more and more e k. Okay, so if I get e k and e k plus one, then the best estimate for the mean is what? The addition of those two, or and divided by two. Okay, so the scalar can be adjusted somehow, but at least I have to keep adding all the Error terms I'm getting, or I should I should do some addition, some accumulation should happen for the error. Okay, but notice in that update equation, accumulation is implicitly happening. How is the accumulation happening? Notice this is an iterative thing. So if I write c k plus one in terms of c zero j, what will happen? Plus beta times summation. The summation automatically comes. Okay, so in the estimate of my gradient, I am actually Doing an accumulation also, which you should, okay, and then beta is taking care of the division, if you will, okay, okay. So, so, so this, so in a way, this adaptive equalizer can be seen as, seen as a way in which you replace the ensemble average by the time average that you will actually get, okay. So that's the way in which you are adapting, and you are hoping that both of them will be the same, okay. So that's another way viewpoint. So you should keep that in mind. There's actually an accumulator here, okay. So this is only a iterative step. 
if you write c k plus 1 in terms of c 0 here you will have a summation okay so that will come automatically okay so keep that in mind so i'm going to show you how this draw a picture to show how the adaptation works out okay so with that i think uh, we should be okay so you have this uh, shift register here Okay, so I will take the jth term. Okay, so maybe after this shift register I have z k plus l minus j. Okay, so maybe. Okay, so all these k and all don't really matter. Okay, so it's just a shift register. The it's it's it holds 2l plus 1 values, that's all. Okay, so you'll have to adapt it and the adaptation will work fine. Okay. So so this one I'm going to multiply with c k j. Okay, and then this goes to the summation unit. Remember the summation unit will get input from everything else also. Okay. And maybe even on this side from somewhere. Okay. And then you produce the filtered output. Okay. So which I am going to slice on one side. Okay. I will draw the slicer here to get my s hat of k which I am going to actually imagine as SK for computing the error. Compute the error. And then what do I do? I have to multiply. Well, I have to conjugate this guy and multiply with what? Beta times EK. Right? It's a very simple expression. And then what should what should I do here? I should actually have a accumulator right and I get c k plus 1 okay so this is this is an accumulator probably a very very badly drawn rough picture but hopefully you see the idea okay so this is how the adaptive loop will happen okay so all these things I mean these are all very digital implemented in computer etc but they all have loops okay so hopefully you see that the loops are there everywhere every time there's a loop what should you be worried about yeah we all should, should always be worried about stability how quickly will it react to things how stable will it be there's always a compromise between those two every time you have a loop and you have to have loops because so only way things will work okay otherwise they don't work in practice okay so and every time you have a loop you have to be very careful it's, it's nice and fine to write one equation saying c k plus 1 equals c k plus something but actually it's causing a loop in your system and you have to be very careful about how quickly it's updating and how stably it's it's updating okay so all these things you have to worry about so usually what people might do in cases where they expect instability is what they will put some clipping on these coefficients okay so they won't let the coefficients go off to wherever they want in fact they might even clip the error maybe error is not too much point in clipping outside of the accumulator maybe you want to clip okay so you don't want to let your coefficients blow up too much okay so all these things are additional things you might want to put in in practice in some situations where you expect instability but these loops are unavoidable in any receiver system okay so in fact you have a lot more loops which we will see as we go along okay so this is just the first loop we are seeing okay the error is feeding back into the adapting of the equalizer coefficients all right this picture is clear right so it's a very simple enough picture but hopefully it's uh, clear for people yes I'm sorry. Oh, so you want to show the convergence? Okay, so I was not planning to do it. If you, if you can, you can see the corresponding section in uh, Barry Lee and Messerschmitt. They have some study of convergence, but uh, I didn't think it was nice enough for me to present in the class. Okay, so but you can study convergence here also. Okay, like you did before, you will study convergence and you can show that it actually works. The best uh, thing for me, convergence here is, if you go to the lab the lab that we are doing and you actually implement this, this will work. <laughs> so for most channels it will work. I have actually done this. I know it works. So, so this really works. Okay. But yeah, so you have some trouble once in a while when the channel is changing and in some cases your coefficients might blow up. If things don't work properly, things might go wrong. All those things will be there but it works. Eventually it works. You can play around with it and it works. That's the best way of doing it. Okay. So, Okay, so I think this is a good point to uh, uh, do a summary of all that we have done and give you a brief uh, brief look into what more is there. So maybe, okay, so maybe the uh, 
之类的，我之类的。OK， so let let's、uh, Okay, oh, I should do DFE. Okay, I'm sorry. So, how do you adapt the DFE? Is the next question. So far, I've only done a linear equalizer. Okay, so you might say DFE also is. Okay. Okay, so the question is, we we motivated this by solving the linear equation, and there it seemed like a complete thing with all the data taken into account, etc., etc. Okay, that's because you had an ensemble average to find phi and alpha. When you don't have that, here you're saying somehow you, it seems like for each k you're doing only one iteration, right? But the iteration keeps building up. So so one might say for the initial part. Right for say maybe the first hundred symbols or thousand symbols, maybe it's not that reliable. Okay, so what you do is you usually train this filter. Okay, so you actually send some hundred symbols which are known to the receiver. Okay, in some other cases actually in some advanced wireless cases you do things differently. You send something called pilots, and there your frequency frequency or your equalization is slightly different. You do something else. So something you have to do some training or pilot sequence or something you have to transmit. to make sure you train the equalizer first a little bit okay so that it has some place to start and after that you let's let it evolve with by decision director okay but otherwise yeah for the first symbol it will be really really bad okay you don't know what the equalizer is it'll be very bad so you have to either have a training sequence or you have to have a pilot somewhere for the equalizer to know what the taps are approximately okay so pilots don't really work in this situation but there's another situation where the pilots work okay More iterations for the same k. What do you mean by more iterations for the same k? Okay. Yeah. If, if, since we know phi, you can do all that solution. If you don't know phi, how do you repeat the iterations? See, you have to be very careful when you do these repetitions. Okay. So if you based, if you do it based on one k, if there is an error, okay, when you repeat it, that same error will build up. Okay, if you can repeat it with some new information where the error is going to decrease, that's okay. So whenever you loop back, you should be careful about that. You can't keep looping back with the same error. Okay, so it will just blow up. Okay, you don't want to blow up that. Okay, be very careful. The next time instead you're getting a new error, which hopefully statistically is evening out and you don't get the blow up. Okay, so all these things are just intuitive high level things, but this is how actual receiver circuits are built. You know, <laughs> you have to think along those lines and build something which will work. Okay. So whenever you have a loop back, you have to be worried about whether you are doing positive feedback or you are doing some average case proper feedback. Okay. So if you are just doing positive feedback over and over again, your coefficient will only build up. Nothing more lab. Okay. All right. So how do you adapt the DFE? Is the question. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I'll simply say the following. It's it's actually not very different. Okay. So you can define a suitable ZK and a suitable CK. Okay. So you have to define. Do you agree with me? It's all a question of defining a suitable ZK and a suitable CK, which is multiplying the ZK. Okay, but but remember the DFE has two different inputs. One input is the channel input. What's the other input? It's actually from the slicer. So your ZK will actually now have both the channel inputs and the slicer outputs in it. Okay, and what about the CK? It will have the C coefficients and the Post cursor coefficients. Okay, so it will have both, and then once you define the error as, so you define all this so that the error still becomes what? S K minus C K transpose Z K. Okay, you define so that this this version is satisfied. Okay, once you do this, the adaptation is exactly the same. You can't do anything else. Okay, you simply do. Beta times e k times z star k. That's what you do. Okay. So once you do this, you simply adapt c k plus one as c k plus beta times e k z star k, and you get your adaptive version. Okay. But remember, z k has to be very carefully written. So one way of doing it is the following. So c k in this case will become what? Remember, 
your DFE, we picked the precursor to be strictly, no, actually it was anti-causal, 0 and minus only, okay, and the post-cursor was strictly causal, okay, so if you write your CK, you will get C, uh, I think minus L, so on down to C0, and then you will have D1 all the way to, I don't know, D, I think I put uh, DM, Okay, some some such thing. I don't know what I used for the order. Okay, so remember what the DFE is. DFE is going to be C of Z, and then slicer inside, and then a D of Z here, right? And then there's going to be a plus minus here. Okay, so this we chose as what summation C M Z power minus M. M went from zero to well, M went from minus. I don't know what I picked. I'm, pick, I'm going to say minus n to 0. Okay. So D of z, I said, is going to be summation dm z power minus m. m goes from 1 to, so I'm going to say capital K. Okay. So this is how we picked. So this is going to be c minus n to 0 and d1 to d capital K. Okay. This will your, be your actual ck. So what will your zk be? If you want the output here to be ck transpose zk. What will your C, ZK be? It's very easy to write down. It will be ZK plus N all the way down to ZK and then what? S hat K minus 1 all the way down to S hat K minus capital K. Is that clear? You simply write it in whatever way you want so that the error becomes SK minus CK transpose ZK. The input to the slicer should always be CK transpose ZK. So you choose suitable vectors ZK and CK such that the input to the slicer becomes CK transpose ZK. So once you write it that way, there is no problem. And then you can just adapt it the exact same way as you want. So DFE linear equalizer makes no difference. Okay. Well, actually it makes a difference. The DFE you expect to be perform better than the MSC linear equalizer, right? So it will be slightly better in several cases. Okay, so one might want to do DFE as opposed to linear equalizer in practice. Okay, but the adapting and the method is basically the same. You have a loop which adapts your coefficients, and the input to the loop is the error always. Okay, but how you compute the error varies depending on what structure you have for the equalizer. Okay, so other than that, it's exactly the same. Okay, so that's the DFE, and uh, so one thing we did not do is we did not derive the DFE for the constraint complexity case. Maybe I will give you an assignment for that. So that will be, that will take care of it. Okay, so, so I think uh, the quiz is coming up on Monday. Okay, and I want to spend the rest of the week solving problems from the tutorial sheets. And uh, tomorrow we have a class, right? And uh, Wednesday we have a class. So we have two, cl two classes. And then Thursday is a holiday, okay? So I would ideally like to meet on Thursday as well. Okay. So hopefully on Wednesday we'll see how we are doing. And based on that, we might we might want to meet on Thursday as well, maybe for one hour or one and a half hours and do some more problems. Okay. So the rest of the week will be problem solving. And Wednesday afternoon we'll st we have we'll have an exam on the sixth tutorial sheet. Okay. So those those of you who want to write can show up on Wednesday afternoon for that. So the sixth tutorial I won't do till Wednesday. Okay. So I'll do it only on Thursday or something. 4th and 5th is what we will solve tomorrow and day after. And if you really want to get anything useful out of it, please try to solve it ahead of time. At least see the problems. Make sure you know what the ideas are behind the problem before you come for class tomorrow.